Uh, this morning we are in chapter two of Daniel. We are just in, in now only week three of our series in Daniel, and uh, I'm really pumped up about today's message. I'm excited about all the rich truths that we have to explore here. Uh, we're going to look at um, this issue of Nebuchadnezzar who has this dream, a nightmare recurring that keeps him from sleeping and he gets very troubled. And, uh, and how does he respond and how does Daniel respond? And we're going to look into those things together today. So I want to invite you to open up a Bible to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, that is on page 737 if you're using one of the worship Bibles. And um, I want to invite you to stand and I'll read our text today. As we give it our attention, we're going to go verses 1 through 30 this morning, and then next week we're going to do the rest of the chapter, Lord willing. Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell the servants, tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. Standard protocol. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream. And I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing in any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was, very, was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to, Antioch, to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made known the matter to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel and his house, went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king its interpretation." 
Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king its interpretation. The king said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would come after this. And he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. This is God's word. May he bless our time in it. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we come to this text with fear and trembling, with the desire to understand the mysteries you have hidden in darkness, with the desire to live with wisdom and not folly and futility, with the desire to walk in humility. Lord, grant that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's nothing like a good night's sleep ruined. How many of you have felt that before? Like a door on a hinge, we keep rolling over and tossing and turning. Our minds are tumbling with restless thoughts, anxiety, pain. The biggest dilemma for me when I can't sleep through the night is, should I get up or not? Do I just stay here and keep rolling over, faking it till I make it? Or do I get up and sip a cup of cozy tea and then hope to crawl back into bed? Because my thoughts are going so crazy and I know it. Anyone with me there? Oh, it's the worst. And Nebuchadnezzar had a series of these. They were the result of a recurring nightmare, which we don't even tell you any details about till next week. So you have to come back next week. So welcome back. We're in week three of Daniel. In Daniel, we're looking for a guide for faithfulness as exiles in a strange culture that's contrary to Christianity. So here's Daniel in exile, and we're seeing ourselves as like Daniel in a strange and weird land. How can we live faithfully before God? And I'm so glad you're here with us for this series. I I just got to give you a warning that if you really get into this, this is really going to challenge you. If you really get into understanding Daniel, you are not going to be the same person in a few months because you're going to be living differently as a result of God's word. So be warned. We should start installing like seatbelts in the pews when we get into books like these. Last week, uh, the first week we saw that your God is sovereign, your enemy is prowling, but your identity is in Christ. Last week, we saw that Daniel's resolve not to defile himself with the king's food was crucial, sacrificial, and blessed, and put him on a trajectory of being blessed under God's mighty hand. Today, we're going to look at three themes as we go through this passage. Number one, man's futility. Number two, God's reality. And number three, Daniel's humility. And if we run out of time, we'll do humility next week. But um, let's start with mankind's futility. If anyone should be able to sleep soundly through the night, it's Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, it should be, right? He's the king of the world. He's everything you would ever want to be. His father is a king. He's the son of a king. He's a young ruler. He's conquered Assyria. He's controlled all of Egypt from where he's at way up here in Babylon. Damascus, Tyre, Sidon, and Jerusalem are all throwing money at him. They're paying tribute to him. He's 30 years old. He's in good health. He just had his annual physical, and everything's great. There's no problems with him. And yet he does not have authority over his sleep. The sovereign guy who has 
people everywhere to do everything. He never makes breakfast. He never cleans up. He never, wa- he never scrubs the toilets. He just walks around all day getting everything he wants all the time. He's the sovereign. If he says, you die, you're dead. That's it. Complete tyrannist or tyrannical guy. Okay? And here he is, and he's totally sovereign, or so he thinks. But there's something that's wrong. He can't fix. Now, we're going to see over the next few chapters that God is on mission to reach King Nebuchadnezzar. This is going to be a, a character arc that's going to develop in the next three chapters with Nebuchadnezzar, now through the end of chapter 5. Okay? And ne- but see, you know, the only way to get his attention is to get inside of him. And God knows how to do that. One of the reasons why we pray for leaders and people in authority is because there is no one who's outside of the reach of God. Are you with me? I mean, like, the Bible says the, the heart of the king is like a watercourse. He, God directs it as he chooses. If God wants Nebuchadnezzar to fall down dead, that's it. If God wants Nebuchadnezzar to have a bad dream, that's what he's going to have. If God wants Nebuchadnezzar to have power, he's going to give him power. Why? To glorify his name and to make him known even to people like Nebuchadnezzar. So don't stop praying for even the worst despots in the world. God is at work. Believe that, especially in this season right now. So he's losing sleep, and that's making him anxious. And we read here in verse 1 and verse 3 that he's troubled. His spirit is troubled. We hear that two times, first from the narrator and then from himself. He tells his own wise men, my spirit is troubled. So he calls in the dream team. He calls for a fourfold, all hands on deck group of specialists to resolve his crisis. He is looking for wisdom. So who does he call? All the wise men. Don't you wish you had wise men who could come tell you smart things too? Oh my gosh, advise me. I have no clue what I'm doing right now. I need some wisdom, okay? So he gets these all magicians, enchanters, sorcerers. And uh, by the way, the Babylonians actually really studied dreams a lot. They had like manuals for how to interpret dreams. And they had like extensive manuals because there's so many kinds of dreams and there's so many kinds of interpretations. And they would like, what they were basically hoping to do was like, get the information, go back to their little study, open up all their scrolls and search, 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 and, and then postulate some solution. That's the normal protocol here. But he's troubled in his spirit. He's, in other words, let's just use this word. He's anxious. He's anxious. And more than anxious, now he's actually beginning to get fearful. Because this dream has something to do with his future, and he knows it. And he's the son of a king. He knows he's got to watch out behind his back. Even his closest, most trusted, loyal cupbearer could poison him. And he needs to know if there's a threat anywhere, he's got to stop it out. He is starting with worst-case scenarios and working backwards all the time. And he's very fearful. And he fears that these wise men are really charlatans or possibly usurpers whose flattery is disingenuous and whose interpretations are not truly supernatural. And so he's a wise king. He sets up a test. And his test is this. I'm not going to tell you my dream. Suffer and figure out that dream, and tell me the dream, and then tell me the interpretation. But you're not getting any help on this homework assignment from me. And if you don't do it, you're dead. Literally. The Hebrew here is like torn limb from, actually it's Aramaic by this point, okay? And uh, it changes actually here at chapter 2 through chapter 7 is in Aramaic. Thankfully we all have it in English, so we don't even notice. But here he says, you're going to be like drawn and quartered. Your your homes are going to be destroyed. Your life is over. Everything you have is going to be abolished and destroyed and gone. And he says, the answer is firm. If you do not make to me known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb. Your houses shall be laid in ruins. Now, if you do, it's a a lot of good stuff coming your way. Gifts and rewards and great honor. So get to it, guys. And they start stalling, and we could read through the whole passage, and they they say, yo, but king, live forever. Give us the dream, and we'll do our work. And, And he's just firm. He will not budge. 
And so he, in verse 9, reaffirms the exact same thing, and these guys know there's no way out, and at this point, he's just done with them. He's like, okay, you guys are just buying time, and I don't have time on my hands. There's a threat that is imminent in my world that I don't know what it is, and you guys are dead because I got to start a clean, I got to have a whole new cabinet. I can't do this another day. And so what we see here, what is all this about? What this is about is that man, in his own wisdom, so-called, suffers futility. We just don't have it. And uh, if Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have it, then you and I don't have it either. And the result of all of this is that after all their stalling, we read here in verse 12 that Nebuchadnezzar moves from anxiety to fear now to anger. Look with me at verse 12. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. His anger is going to be destructive. He's going to destroy lives because of his anxiety and fear and anger. And it's all futile. I mean, what's he going to get if he gets rid of every single wise man? I mean, now he's killed off some of his best guys. How is he going to, this is going to be terrible. He's not even thinking through the implications of his destructive death sense, sentence. So let's just think about emotions for a minute, okay? Do you see people in our society today suffering from anxiety? How about fear? Whew, lots of fear. Anger? We're just rife with those emotions, aren't we, right now? That's why this is so relevant. It's not a far-off story about something that once upon a time. This is about how things go in the world. And when we are futile in our lack of wisdom and our distance from God, we run out of resources and we just have this emotional meltdown and our whole culture is on tilt right now because we are like this. Anxious, fearful, and angry. The, you know, the older I get, the, the, I, it's so funny. I look back in history and recent history and modern events, and it, like, as I go back and like, look at old times, I go, it seems like almost every decade since like 1970, everyone thinks we're just like one step away from cataclysm. Have you ever noticed that? Like, oh my gosh, like whether it's the Cuban Missile Crisis or the stock market in 87 or 2000 or 2008, it's just always the end. And the rise of Islam, the rise of secularism. Just, just pick something. There's a hundred ways we just all think it's about to be over. And people who love like eschatology and think the end is, they just love looking around for stuff. You know, like, I think that person might be the Antichrist and I think the temple is going to get built soon and I think Jesus is coming back soon. And they're just, I mean, especially Christians. We're bad at this. We're so, I mean, oh, I'm so done with, okay, I'll, we'll get into eschatology later. <laughs> what if our eschatology gave us stability and wisdom and a view of history, not just some checked out, get me to the next world crisis, I'm just going to get raptured out of here. You know, we're so useless because we don't believe that what happens in our lives right now really matters now in this world. We're gonna, oh man, I can't wait to get to chapter 7, 8, and 9. You're going to really have to buckle up then. Mm. So here's the question. Is there a better way to live? Yes, thank God. There's some good news in this message, right? Here's a, here's a quote from Dallas Willard. It goes something like this. The gospel is not just a message about if you die tonight, where will you spend eternity? It's a message about if you wake up tomorrow, how will you live your life? That's the relevance. We don't hold forth hope for only the life to come. We do. And that's a big hope. But if that was it, like, that's really hollow. I mean, if that's all that Christianity offers, I'm going to quit being a pastor and just go evangelize some people and sleeping on Sunday mornings. 
I mean it. My life's too short. But you know what? The good news is that Christianity and the Word of God has so much to tell us about how to live an eternal kind of life right here, right now. That's what you're called to. We all need wisdom. We need to wake up and see our need for God's wisdom or else we're going to be in cycles of futility that will end in anxiety and fear and death. I just turned 50 this week, by the way. Big news flash. Yeah, no applause. I yeah, No, it's okay. I am now old enough to know that I'm not worthy of the applause. This is my prayer for the next decade of my life. As I turn 50, I want to mark the passing of this milestone with a resolute pursuit to gain wisdom. I am now mature enough to see that my former immaturity and cluelessness needs to be left behind. I have got to get wisdom so thoroughly, so fast, so badly. I, I'm so thirsty for it. I was reading Proverbs 2 last week. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your ear to understanding, Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, where is that? Like in the ground, in rocks, and search for it as a hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the ways of his saints. That's, that's, uh, that's where I'm going in my life. Now that I've lived half a century, finally, I'm doing this. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have life to the full. Jesus says, my peace I give with you. Not as the world gives, I give you my peace. He says, in this world you have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The first call of this passage is to recognize the futility of our lack of wisdom and desperately look for answers. You've got to be as shrewd as Nebuchadnezzar, not as destructive, but you've got to know you have a problem. You've got to know that those sleepless nights are there for a reason. You've got to know that the things that disturb you and the emotional upheaval you're going through is a signal. It's a warning on the dashboard of your life. You need wisdom. You need to change. You need to grow up. I can finally say that. So let's look for answers about this quest in the second point, God's reality. First was man's futility. Let's look at God's reality. Now, here's where we're headed in this section. At the end of this passage, we're going to get to these verses in 27, 28. No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Now, word of Nebuchadnezzar's decree came late to Daniel because, remember, this is only like the second or third year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, according to the text, right? This is the second year. Daniel arrived in the first year. He's like halfway through his three-year immersion training process. So he's like a junior wise man, okay? So he wasn't in the room where all this stuff happened. He was hitting the books, okay? And uh, so the word comes to him secondarily. The decree is coming down, and now Ariok and... He's being told, you know what? You're in the same class as all those wise guys that couldn't figure stuff out, and so you're all dying. Sorry. So now Nebuchadnezzar's crisis has become Daniel's crisis. Recognize that not every crisis you go through in life is because of what you did. Sometimes it's because of what other people did. I mean, Daniel's life is because of what other people did. Jehoiakim, who lived for the future, remember? Sermon number one. He was living, I'll have peace in my days. Not Daniel, though, not in his days. He's going to live in Babylon. And so the decree goes out, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Thankfully, Daniel was given a gift. 
back in chapter 1. As a result of his resolve not to defile himself and to stay pure and focused before the Lord. What gift did God give Daniel? Well, verse 17 of chapter 1. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. More than sheer skill, Daniel had wisdom. We already see he possesses wisdom. And, you know, God gives wisdom to the wise. If you're wise enough to seek wisdom, you're going to get more of it. If you're too foolish to know that you don't know, need wisdom, then you're going to pass by that exit sign and just keep driving down the road wherever you're going, the wrong direction. And Daniel uses wisdom from his first response, verse 14. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. So here's Daniel. He's going to have discretion. God's going to get, he's got to really walk this tightrope, right? Razor's edge. He's got to come before the king and ask for more time without getting, a, you know, framed like these other guys that were asking for more time essentially. But so he's got to say, I can do it, but I need time. Okay. And thankfully God knows that, uh, Daniel knows that God is real. And so Daniel's not ruffled like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, even though he's a young enslaved exile, he seems to be free of anxiety and fear and anger. Amazingly, he gets an audience with the king. He gets a stay of execution. He buys more time, something the wise men could not do. And now he's going to intercede and praise God and glorify God. So the next thing that Daniel does is that he gathers his companions Verse 17, Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. Remember, remember their names. Like he's like this, if you're a Hebrew reading this, you're like, then God is my judge, Daniel, goes back to his house and he sees his friends. God is gracious. Who's like God? And God is a strong helper. I bet you that was encouraging to Daniel. Every time he thought of their names, like this is first language for him. This is how he thinks. Every time he hears the name Mishael, he's like, yeah, who's like God? No one's like God. Michelle, right? Every time he hears Azariah, he's like, oh, God is my itzer, my strong helper. I need help right now, God. Azariah, pray for me. Pray together. Let's pray. We've got to pray. Now, the word for companions is chaver. I want to ask you a question. Do you have friends, companions, with whom you can share your troubles? Most of us don't, or we have them, but we don't share them. The word for chaver, what chaver means is a friend, like a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A, there are two people bonded together. A bond of friendship where others know you and they are your people. Where do you find friends like this? Where do you find friends who will pray for you, struggle with you? I mean, maybe for you this morning, the most practical thing you need to hear from my message is that you may feel like you're in exile. but that there is someone in your life whom God is sending or has sent or is not far away that is available and only a call away. You see, it's a, it's a mistake to think that we're lo- alone. We don't have to be alone. Every time someone takes their own life by suicide, so many people come around and say, if only we had known, if this person would have shared I've been practicing this lately. I've been just sharing more parts of my life with people I trust. And boy, I find that they're so encouraging. And I need that. It's so good. I found that when I share my true self, including my troubles with companions, we both draw closer. Um, Todd, can you turn down the AC a little bit? It's just really warm in here. I see people using fans. That's a sign that it's too hot. We're not in the fiery furnace uh, yet, so we don't need that. I don't know why it's not kicking on. It should have kicked on like half an hour ago. So Daniel asked his companions, his chaverot, to pray for him. And he told them to seek mercy from God concerning this mystery. Now, this is real prayer, okay? These guys are praying like the foxhole prayer. Okay, like Foxhole is that place down in the bunker in a war where you're about to go up and like die. And so you're like, God, I've, I know I'm not that 
I know I'm not even worthy to even ask this thing, but I'm about to go over this hill and I'm about to go do my mission and I want to live. Save me, God. Please. I know you're real. That's, that's the kind of prayer these guys are praying right now. They're having a prayer meeting, okay? Real prayer. The way you pray is needful, urgent, believing, persevering. Yeah, we don't pray like this because we don't see the, the, the bigness, the magnitude of our needs. But you know what? We, it's because we just don't recognize our needs. <laughs> if we saw how needy we really were, we'd be, we'd be praying. It's that, it's that basic. Just every once in a while, we, God really gets our attention. We're like, oh God, this is really big now. You know, God's like, it's always big. You're always not seeing it. See it. Uh, D. Duke says it this way. Almost everyone believes that prayer is important. But there is a difference between believing that prayer is important and believing that prayer is essential. <laughs> Thank you. The, prayer is essential. Uh, this is something that I'm, I'm working on. We can keep that on medium low though, John. That's okay. <laughs> That's really loud. All right. Sorry for all the distractions. Uh, this is my prayer for myself and for our church, for us here at Grace Covenant, is that we would pivot from believing that prayer is important to believing that prayer is essential. We're going to see Daniel and his friends, his companions. Daniel especially, though, as an intercessor repeatedly in this book, praying. So we're going to keep coming back to this. But I want to let you know, I'm kind of like a dog with a bone about prayer right now. And I think it's going to last for a while. I can do no better than the words of John Chrysostom. The potencies of prayer have subdued the strength of fire, have bridled the rage of lions, have hushed anarchy to rest extinguished wars, appeased the elements, expelled demons, burst the chains of death, expanded the gates of heaven, assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. Prayer is an all-sufficient panoply, a treasure undiminished. A mind which is never exhausted. A sky unobscured by clouds. A heaven unruffled by storm. It is the root, the foundation, and the mother of a thousand blessings. You have not, because you ask not. Now, the amazing thing about this passage is that God answers the prayer like instantly. There's like no delay here. I love this part. Sometimes when we're beginners, like chapter two, God answers quickly. Sometimes like later on, the fiery furnace thing, he doesn't answer till the last second. But we keep praying. So while Nebuchadnezzar tosses and turns, Daniel the prophet rests and receives the vision. As we'll see next week, God gives Daniel a perfect revelation of God's, his own plans, purposes, and ways. God reveals the future of the world and makes known the meaning to Daniel as well. And so now, Daniel praises God. This passage right here is so amazing, and I'm going to run out of time, I can tell. Daniel begins to praise God. And so his prayer of intercession, now what we see the bulk of is actually his prayer of thanksgiving, his prayer of glorifying God. And for the first time in the book, we begin to see a glimpse of the character of God in its like glory. Look with me. If you have your Bibles, just open them back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel blessed the God of heaven and he answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Where's the quest, right? Nebuchadnezzar needs wisdom. Guess who's got it? Guess who's got all of it? Guess who's got plenty to give? Wisdom, it's God. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. 
Just think about this list of attributes Daniel is just cascading on right here. God's eternal. He lives forever. Praise forever. Therefore, he's unchanging, right? He's always going to be praised because he, not only is he going to live forever, he's always going to be the same forever. He's powerful. He's almighty, omnipotent. He's sovereign. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. Like the way a child plays with their Barbie dolls. Like just, you know, okay, you go over here. I don't like you anymore. Boom. Pop your head off. That's like, well, the guys play with Barbie dolls that way. I'm sorry. That was really a bad moment. All right. Need a little bit of levity. He's sovereign. He removes kings. Sets up good. That's what God does with kings, though. They're like nothing to him. All the kings of the earth. He's the king of kings. God is wise. He, you know, the problem with our wisdom and lack of it is we don't know what's going to happen when we do certain things. We don't know the outcome of our actions. We don't know what we're doing when we do it. We just kind of are like groping around like a person in the middle of the night where all the shades are drawn and we are trying not to stumble when we come back into bed and not break our toe on anything. We don't know the future. We just don't see it. But God knows the, rest, the best path and he reveals deep and hidden things. God knows what's in darkness. He is omniscient. There's nothing he can't know, nothing he can't see. He knows what is in the heart of a man. He knows what is in the mind of a woman. He knows what is the thought and intentions. Before a word is on your tongue, O Lord, you know it completely before a word is on my tongue. You know it all the way. I didn't even say it yet. Didn't get it out. Okay. He knows that. And lastly here in this passage, God is enlightened. Light dwells with him. You want wisdom? You want enlightenment? Buddha doesn't have it. Yahweh does. Who is like our God? This is Daniel's word of praise. Okay, we can do this. Only one more page of notes. I promise. Thirdly, Daniel's humility. Now, Arioch is so glad to hear the good news from Daniel. He brings Daniel in before the king, and he says, and, and, and he's just so grateful that he's not going to have to slaughter everybody. Uh, but, you know, Arioch here is uh, not very humble. He's self-promoting. Look at verse 25. Then Arioch brought in Daniel from before, uh, before the king in haste and thus said to him, listen to Arioch, this is just classic. I have found among the je- exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king its interpretation. He's taking all the credit. Do you see that? He's like, I found this guy. Like, no, you didn't. You were going to kill him and he begged for mercy and then... He, he prayed all night and he got the answer and he's the wise man. You're just like the executioner who didn't have to do his job today, right? But he's totally self-promoting. He's like not humble. He's just trying to like not die. He knows how, like, you know, the, you know, the thing is, he knows what's going to happen, right? If he doesn't kill everyone, he's going to die for not killing everyone. He's just like, everyone's life's on the line in this uh, tyranny here, right? In contrast, Daniel is self-effacing and God-promoting, okay? Look at verse 26. So the king declares to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, which means the one who stands before the king. Are you able to know, make known to me the dream that I have seen, part A, and B, its interpretation? Now look at Daniel's answer. He doesn't just go, yes, I am. Or, you know, you know, king, it was really hard to do. And before I give it to you, I'd like to negotiate a little pay raise around here. It's a little tough for me and the Hebrew boys down there and the Kind of the, you know, eating the king's food isn't so good. We had to resort to vegetables. And, you know, I really want to let you know that I worked really hard on this project for you. So I hope you're, no, none of that. He doesn't even take credit for himself. Like, yes, I can do it. Right? The king asks him, are you able? And his answer is totally deflective. Right? He says this, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. By the way, earlier, Daniel has already interceded and asked for more time for the, so that none of the other wise men have to die either. He's already looking out for his fellow pagans. He cares about their lives here, today, now. And so he's getting them off the hook by what he says. Verse 28, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days do you realize he didn't even use his own pronoun in that sentence? He's not even in it. He's not even there. Because he's so humble, everything has to point back to God all the time for Daniel. 
when you know God like this, humility isn't even a thing you've got to pretend or work up. You have to be like, oh, okay, I can be really humble. No. When you know who God is, humility is all you know. You can't be anything but humble. Are you with me? When you know God is the one who reveals mysteries and that you're only alive by the skin of your teeth because God answered the prayers of you and your friends because you believe that prayer was essential and he gave you that dream so that your life is spared and so that God can work sovereignly in this pagan king to bring him one step closer to his real knowledge of God, Daniel's like, I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy I can be used. And this is really all about God. So, Where do we go from this? In conclusion, there are two paths, right? Futility versus humility. You're either going to be like Nebuchadnezzar, who's struck with fear, anxiety, anger, death, failure, worldly wisdom, insecurity, pride, and the end of man's strength. Or you're going to be like Daniel, with faith, prudence, discretion, life, success, God's wisdom, humility, and God's power. I don't know about you, but I know which side of the piece of paper I want to be on when it comes to my life. I don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar in the futility of man's wisdom. I want to be like Daniel in the blessing of God's revelation and wisdom and life. I hope you'll join me there. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this really cool story. We thank you for the way that you set it up. It's, it kind of reminds me of like the prophets of Baal so long ago, like an impossible thing that Elijah's opponents could not do. But then you stepped in and did something. Lord, I pray for anyone this morning who's feeling that they're at the end of their rope. They're feeling like there's a lot of regret or a lot of anxiety or a fistful of fear or a heart of anger. And I pray that you would minister your grace to them and give them the hope that comes from acknowledging you and seeking your face, and seeking the wisdom that you reveal. I pray that you would surround every one of us with companions, with chavarot, true friends, praying friends, commiserating friends, empathetic friends, loyal friends, friends upon whose name and identity you are at work so that we can mutually bless one another. Give us more of the gift of friendship. Give us more of the intentionality of prayer. And we pray that you would do amazing and unsearchable things in us, through us. Not for us, but for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.